So let's get to your questions. I think this session has many very important topics. So as you look through the questions, I have a question for Gideon. You meant when you talked about the big picture and managing PSC, you talked about this important to provide a um, kind of personalized, um, individualized care. Do you mind highlighting some of the things that you do in your clinical practice to be able to achieve that? Um, uh, so when our clinical practice is evolving, but the way it's evolving is we have fought hard with our hospital to get a specialist nurse. So I now have a specialist nurse for autoimmune liver disease who covers all the autoimmune liver diseases. So I'm hoping that will be beneficial to patients to have someone to speak to other than the doctor. We are pushing for virtual clinics, and this is clearly very relevant to a US audience where travel is a big thing, but you want to go to a specialist center, but you don't want to be popping in and out. So Skype consultations, FaceTime as an ability to, to stay in touch with your clinical practice, and that really does personalize it. And um, something that came up, which we haven't solved yet, but it came up at the FDA meeting, is about clinical trials. So often, the people with the greatest unmet need are the people who've got full-time jobs and children to look after, who live 500 miles away from their clinical trial center. So there is a big push to try and work out how we can make things a lot easier so people can have their blood test done locally and still take part. So those are the sort of broader structural um, ways of that we've, we've got the clinic to make it personalized. From a very direct person in front of you, I mean, we're very open with the patient's blood results. All our patients have electronic access to their blood tests, and in fact, they all read the clinic letters that I write. So they can read them if they want to go to the archipelago, you know, anywhere they like, they can read the clinic letter, and they can, they can ask questions, and they can see whether we've, we've addressed their, their needs. And I think, I think that, and we, we are trying to learn how to use biochemistry and fiber scan in conjunction with the patient, so we don't quite know what it means. Um, and, and so we try very hard so the patient leaves understanding where they are on the spectrum and where they might be headed. Thank you. OK, there's a question for Olivier on uh, routine MRI screening. How should we perform that? On uh, MRI screening? Yeah. So it's, uh, as mentioned uh, by, by Gideon, so we, we, we don't know uh, how uh, often we, we should perform uh, MRI, so of course uh, at the time of uh, diagnosis. So uh, I think the, the point is uh, why you, do you perform uh, a, a, a MRI? So m our experience, if the goal is uh, the uh, early de detection of cholangiocarcinoma, so it, it's very, very disappointing. But uh, in terms of, uh, n I mean, natural history or uh, factors of bad prognosis uh, without cholangiocarcinoma, it, it could uh, help. But uh, uh, for uh, early detection of cholangiocarcinoma, I think we cannot r recommend uh, uh, routine uh, M MRI, but of course we have to, to look uh, at the gallbladder, but maybe by uh, just ultrasounds. That's a, a very important point to check the gallbladder. That's a clear answer, and there are many questions with regard to performing ERC, and one of the questions is, after a balloon dilation mark, how long will the stricture, rem uh, stricture remain open? So that's a, an excellent question, and um, the answer is I don't know. I don't think any of us really know. You know, the, the issue is flow limitation across a stricture, not necessarily what it looks like on a picture. And one of the, the problems with the uh, pictures that we get of the bile duct is that when we inject contrast during an ERCP, it tends to open a stricture if you're injecting under pressure. Uh, and similarly, MRI may, may, may exaggerate the tightness of a stricture because there's no injection. There's nothing opening the stricture. There may be a nearby vessel just pushing on the bile duct in that area, making it look narrow. And so we have a very hard time judging how uh, the degree of flow limitation in these strictures. And it may be that very small changes in the stricture make the difference between the person feeling completely well and having no symptoms or being really quite sick from that stricture. So, so uh, I don't really know how long it stays. Uh, looks better on an x-ray. However, I would say that 
if you ask how long till the person gets sick again from that stricture, it's highly variable. And some people will have a balloon dilation of a stricture and within a period of weeks are back with the same problem they had to start with, either jaundice or infection. And there we would really think about putting stents, which at our practice are not first line. In our practice, the first line is just balloon dilation. But uh, there we would think about stents, but then again, only for a short period, maybe a few weeks, and take the stents out. They're a conduit for bacteria. We don't like to leave them long term. Um, other people will dilate their stricture, and they may, they may not have jaundice again for years, if ever. And so it's highly variable, and we don't have good predictors about why that is. Any other comments from, from the panelists? Well, I think most of us will agree on that. Yeah. And a follow-up question on that is, what does it mean if ERCP shows no dominant stricture, but the patient is deteriorating? Mm. So uh, that's also a good question. And I'll go back to the case of jaundice. Uh, if uh, the patient is jaundiced and the ERCP shows really no flow obstructing stricture in the bile duct, then my conclusion is that the jaundice is more to do with liver function than with blockage of flow in the, in the bile ducts. And uh, then I would look to my hepatology colleagues and say, well, is there anything you can do from the liver point of view to improve the liver function? Is there a drug that could, that's responsible or an infection that's playing a role? Or is it time for liver transplantation? And so those are, would be the things I would think about if, if I did ERCB for jaundice and found no uh, flow limiting stricture. Any comments? I think that's fair, but I mean, in, in our practice, we, would, we very rarely do ERCP um, unless we really have a good indication. So for someone who's jaundiced, we would do an MRCP. And if that was reviewed in a multidisciplinary team and there was clearly you know, no dominant stricture or there were just multiple intrahepatic strictures, then we wouldn't subject the patient to an ERCP because the chance of having a beneficial effect is very low and the risks of um, seeding that patient with infection and then really making this quite difficult is quite high. So, I mean, I think that, that speaks to how different centres have evolved in sort of different directions in, on how they sort of think about the tubular component of the disease. So there's the uh, <coughs> multiple questions regarding uh, fibro scan versus MRE. So that would be for Olivier. So the questions are, um, how do you compare bells in terms of um, assessing fibrosis in PSC? Should we get bells or is one better than the other? Or are so, they better than the liver biopsy? So we, uh, it's a, an excellent question, but we, we, we don't know yet because uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is uh, at this time no head-to-head uh, -head comparison between uh, fibroscan and uh, MRE. But uh, of course, we we had to to perform uh, such a, a, a study, and uh, I understand that some centres are, are are working uh, on this. But uh, you know, in, in Europe. Uh, 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 MRE is uh, just a beginning because uh, it's, uh, at least in Europe, it, it's very expensive, uh, whereas a fibro scan is uh, very uh, cheap. But you have to, to address the issue of, of quality, of accuracy first. So uh, I think the next coming years you will get the, uh, the answer. The follow-up question for that is, how often do you, do you recommend that people get fibro scan? So uh, again, yeah, uh, it's not fully v validated, but uh, in uh, my center, we we perform fibro scan on a routine basis uh, a a every year. But Mark, maybe you can comment on the availability of fibro scan in the U.S. That was one of the questions. Wow, I don't know the answer to that one. I would, John, what's the availability of FibroScan in the U.S.? It's very common. Uh, it's becoming more and more available. It's available at our center, and we're using it. Um, do, you, do you want to come here and speak into a microphone? <laughs> Sorry, my colleague John Eaton knows more about this than I do. So I think that uh, our experience has been that the FibroScan is becoming increasingly available since it was approved for use several years ago in the United States. Uh, at least at our center, we're using it increasingly more commonly. Um, and we are also using MRE elastography as well. 
I would say for our patients with PSC, our practice has been to use MR elastography at the same time as an MRCP because it only adds a few extra minutes to the examination and doesn't add any additional cost, at least at our center, to the MRCP that's already being performed. I think I would comment um, on that. So in Northern California, at least around our region, almost all, every center has fibro scan and most of ha um, us also have MRE. I think um, it's becoming more accessible. And I may, I may comment from our own experience is uh, that uh, spleen size itself is not much worse than performing all these complicated examinations. <laughs> so that is available everywhere. <laughs> and uh, it's a very simple and, and uh, very good means of, uh, of uh, estimating prognosis. So another question to, to Mark is, what is the risk of accelerating PSC from performing ERC? I think this is a very important question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So um, I would take a step or two back and say that um, there's probably some differences in outcomes with ERCP based on the, the center and the team per, uh, performing the procedure, and that it's great to have a team doing this who is very used to and comfortable with PSC. Um, I would say that there is a risk that ERCP could accelerate the course of PSC, and Gideon's already referred to it, which is the risk of infection. Uh, so uh, if infection is introduced up into the bile ducts, it can increase the inflammation in the bile ducts, increase the, the, the occurrence of cholangitis, bacterial cholangitis, and worsen the course. And we have data uh, from Scandinavia looking at this where they looked at people who had an ERCP and did not receive preventative antibiotics and compared them to those who had received preventative antibiotics and clearly there was a difference. And so it's very important if you have PSC and you're having an ERCP to receive antibiotics before or at the time of the ERCP and then also afterwards for a period of days. Fortunately, that seems to be quite effective in terms of preventing infectious complications. Another equally important aspect to preventing that is good endoscopic technique to be sure that what's been in, the ducts that have been injected can actually drain. And if they're left uh, blocked and undrained at the end of the procedure, there will be a high incidence of infection, as, as Gideon said. Can I just ask a question about the Mayo? So when you make a decision about ERCP, do you do it as a team? And you do it in a sort of MDT situation where you talk about the patient before you recommend the ERCP? Because I would have thought that's probably actually part of the key is how the decision's made. Yeah, that's a great point also. And yes, I would say the decision is made as a team. We don't tend at our place to have a weekly conference because it's too long to wait to have a weekly conference. So the, the way our practice works, uh, I, a colleague in liver clinic would typically be seeing the patient, for instance, John, uh, who's here today. And uh, there's certain, we've agreed on certain clear, what we feel are clear cut indications for uh, ERCP where we don't need to discuss, but if there's any, if there's a question, and often there is, there's gray zones and, and, and particular issues that matter, then we'll have a conversation. We'll look at the imaging and the labs together and make a joint decision. And you're absolutely right. I think it's actually quite helpful to our patients that me, the endoscopist, is not making the decision, you know, at least not in isolation, and that my hepatology colleagues are, are, are really uh, steering the, the boat. I think this is an important point really to consider and uh, follow, following up on the role of bacteria in the bile ducts for disease progression. Is there a role for long-term use of oral antibiotics? Difficult question. Well, um, and I'll be interested in what my colleagues here have to say as well, but my view is that I don't know of any evidence that this is beneficial in the long term. And I'm a bit worried about just the process of selecting out increasingly resistant organisms so that uh, if a bacterial, if, if there's a true blockage of the bile ducts and the bacteria spreads to the bloodstream, it'll be harder than ever to treat because of its resistance to antibiotics. So I'm a little cautious of, of this idea of rotating antibiotics. And if someone can't stop antibiotics without fever and chills and bacterial cholangitis, I think there's probably a duct somewhere that needs to be, to be uh, where blockage needs to be relieved. But I'll, I'll, Gideon, what do you think about this? So again, we take an individual approach. So we start off with ciprofloxacin as our first line choice 
uh, unless the patient requires hospitalisation. And then we do use rotating antibiotics if patients report um, frequent um, cholangitis and in the absence of any MR imaging that suggests um, an intervention will help them. And then we would rotate three antibiotics. I tend to use ciprofloxacin, uh, cotrimoxazole and or, uh, um, Augmentum, which I think in the, in the Americans says amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. I agree there's no data and we do it empirically in a small group of patients. Um, we do sometimes see, particularly where the recurrent cholangitis has been triggered by ERCP, perhaps in a non-specialist setting, um, that that actually helps the patient. They get over there, they've got, usually have got difficult stricturing PSC in the absence of liver failure and we do sometimes see those patients sort of manage to get through the year and then come off it. But you're absolutely right, we then take a very close look as to whether or not they've met the criteria for liver transplantation. The problem about liver transplantation, of course, it all depends on where you are and the rules for listing. And so um, listing in the UK, at least for a current cholangitis with a normal MELD score, is actually quite hard to actually get a liver. So it, it, we, we try not to make that part of our thought process, but it, you, you can't not include the actual reality. So we, we, we take a sort of pragmatic approach, but you're, you're absolutely right, the, the evidence is difficult. I think one thing that we do forget sometimes in patients with PSC is to bear in mind the risk of fungal infection. Um, now, we don't treat that, that many patients with fluconazole, but we do, we do recognize on some of our explants, particularly in patients who've had stricturing PSC, who've had lots of problems that actually, when you look at the explant, it's actually a non-bacterial infection, and they've, they've actually had some form of candida, um, which is a consequence of infection. I, I don't know what you do in Paris for antibiotics. Yeah, yeah no, no we, we don't uh, use long-term antibiotics, uh, uh, except uh, for uh, recurrent cholangitis. But uh, I agree with the, the role of uh, fungal infection, and it has been shown that it's a uh, uh, factor of uh, bad prognosis, but how, how to treat them and how to make the diagnosis of this fungal infection so it's not so, so, so easy. Okay, switching to the symptoms, there are two questions for Gideon on itch. Where does it come from? What other diseases, what other diseases must be excluded and does acupressure help? So, <laughs> well, I mean, it's easy. You can go back to historic 500 years ago. It comes from the bile. It's definitely an evil humor in the bile. And we, we know that because um, it's not been so much the case in PSC, but in the related small bile disease, PBC, if you have something called a nasobiliary drain, so that's essentially endoscopically placed by our endoscopy colleagues, a, a drain that goes through the nose into the bile duct, and you drain the bile freely into a bag, rather than letting it enter into your bowel, then your, your itch will go away instantaneously. Now the problem is that that falls out, so it's not effective, but it proves the point. And we also know that there are now drugs out there that do that chemically. So there, have been, there are a number of companies working on drugs which are called ASBT inhibitors. Um, and so there will be data at ASLD showing that in PBC, one of the ASBT inhibitors, which essentially does a chemical nasobiliary drain, does re reduce the itch in patients with PBC. So I, I'm pretty sure that it's a component of bile. As to what it is, I don't know, but that perhaps explains why it's such a difficult symptom. It's like having ants under your skin. Um, and so that's why the, 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 the symptom is so devastating for patients. It's doubly hard in PSE because um, the degree of itch is often a, a, a factor of the degree of ductal obstruction. And not just the degree of ductal obstruction, but um, you know, when you've got a damaged bile ducts and essentially you've got flow of bile, that bile can become granular, it can become start, you know, and so you get, you get times when the, the flow of bile will slow down and then of course the, your, your symptoms will get worse and then actually your biliary tree solves the problem, the bile gets a bit thinner and the bile flows again. So that you, you, you get into this difficulty of knowing whether you should take you know, therapy all the time when, it, when it's fluctuating. I don't see any problems with treatments such as acupuncture pressure if, that, if that's what people want to try. Um, there's no doubt that it's a real symptom, but at the end of the day, just like all symptoms, you have to live with that symptom. And so <clears throat> the, the impact of a symptom is always going to be um, related to your own personal coping strategies and your own co you know, personal experiences. So things such as acupuncture ha have no problem. And you know, some interesting data that's come out from PBC um, about fatigue, which is a very important symptom in cholestasis, is that fatigue severity is very much linked to social isolation. Um, 
Now, social isolation is a complex topic, but essentially, you know, if your, if your social support mechanisms aren't so, as strong as you'd like, then the impact of a symptom can be greater. Okay, so things such as patient support groups are a therapy for uh, factors such as social isolation and how you cope with chronic disease and therefore actually impact on your therapies, your symptoms as well. Okay, another question on ERSO treatment. If a patient develops cholangiocarcinoma, and I would like to extend that to a dominant stricture, should he still be taking ERSO or not? This can be answered by any of you. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so, you know, so the first thing is, I, you know, I don't beat up my patients in terms of whether they should or shouldn't take UDCA. What I tell them is that I don't believe there's any evidence that UDCA helps them. But, you know, at the right dose, I don't believe it's harmful. Um, and therefore, depending on, you know, reimbursement and where you are, you know, there's no guilt or shame as to whether you want to stay on it or whether you don't want to use it. I think that, generally speaking, I'm a very pragmatic clinician and um, I tend to only change one thing at a time in my clinical practice. So when I'm faced with complex clinical problems and you know, PSC clinic is a complex clinic, I try and be logical and only make one change at a time. And therefore it's not my practice to change therapy such as UDCA if, they're on stable, if patients are on stable therapy if there isn't a good, good reason and the development of you know, carcinoma or dominant stenosis, I, I wouldn't stop their therapy because it, unless I saw a logical reason as to it, help, it was going to help me, what I would be concerned about is it might confuse me. And so, you know, in the broader context, remember we, we published on this and we know this from the PVC world, if you stop your UDCA, your liver test will change, okay? And it's quite surprising how much they do change. <laughs> and, you know, that actually shocks patients to discover actually what's really going on underneath that UDCA umbrella. You know, you can stop your UDCA and your transaminases can go to three or four hundred. Okay, and you know, with the UDCA, there's no evidence of helping you. So, but suddenly you're then very worried about the, the, the transaminases and what they mean. So, I tend to be as logical as possible and only change something if I feel it's going to benefit. And, and if I think it's just going to confuse and it's not doing any harm, then I'm afraid I'm a pathway of least resistance. I continue. Short comment, Olivier. I, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, uh, UDCA in France is approved for PSC, so it's our usual policy to, to give UDCA in PSC patients. And uh, I agree with Gedeon, when we make change in treatment, you have to, uh, to go step by, by step. And so we, we stop UDCA uh, on, uh, only in patients with, uh, when we decide uh, uh, to, to leave the patient for uh, transplantation and uh, so at this time so he, he can, uh, with uh, stopping UDCA, usually he gets uh, a higher male score so it's good to, to get uh, quickly uh, a, a liver graft. Okay, another very practical question with regard to colonoscopy. A patient is diagnosed with PSC and the colonoscopy shows only mild unspecific inflammation and on next colonoscopy, the inflammation is gone. Does this patient have colitis? And what do we do with regard to surveillance with these? Yeah. Very good question. I mean, in essence, again, you look at the whole patient. So the answer is yes. Um, there's no, the, the severity of the inflammation isn't, isn't the issue. It's the fact that there is inflammation there, and it's been detected once. So I personally play on the side of caution and I label that patient as PSC-IBD and I encourage them to have regular surveillance colonoscopies. The caveat to that is our colonoscopy colleagues are getting much better at risk stratification. And so what we need to learn is how do we use things like fecal calprotectin, which measure inflammation, and how do we make that colonoscopy more informative for that individual. So there are studies in the UK and across Europe where we're looking at, people, not me, but colleagues are looking at, you know, the nature of the biopsy, any molecular features on the biopsy or any features in the stool which actually try to sort of stratify that low risk, 
that lowest patient. And I, I, I do trust my colonoscopy colleagues, and if they have someone who's had regular screening and they really don't see any inflammation, they feel they're doing adequate either dye spray or you know, other advanced colonoscopy skills, and they say, I really think we can move to two yearly colonoscopy, then I, th I think that's reasonable. It's just we don't yet have the evidence to completely support it. But I think there is enough greater evidence in the IBD field, IBD field generally that the IBD doctors are getting much better at working out who needs very intense surveillance and who needs less surveillance. And we just, we just need to learn from them. Okay, in the last two minutes, let's talk about the future. Mark, is there a role or will there be a role for drug eluting stents? And Gideon, will there be antifibrotic treatment or is it already outside of the US available? <laughs> wow, great question. So, um, you know, the uh, ERCP provides a route to get to the bile ducts, and this is a bile duct disease, PSC, so it's a great question. Could you put something there that would provide treatment? And uh, as of yet, we don't have anything uh, promising in that regard. You know, people have tried, and uh, Gideon showed a slide of all the systemic drugs that have been tried that haven't really been beneficial uh, in PSC. Whether the drug could be delivered at much higher dose directly to the bile duct, and, uh, and be the sort of magic bullet is a very appealing idea. I'm actually somewhat skeptical, though, that that will be the solution because there's something else underlying, as we heard this morning, genes and environment that's driving the inflama inflammatory process. And it's likely we have to get at that underlying process to really have a, have a cure. Well, to, to the short answer for the antifibrotics is not yet. But I think it is, it, it's not an unreasonable thing to consider in the, in, in the jigsaw therapies that we're going to like to have for our patients. And I think the, the likelihood that there's going to be one single approach to treating PSC is low, and that we're likely to need to have a sort of a platform approach to treating disease. I don't believe that just using antifibrotics will be sufficient. It doesn't make sense that, you know, if your house is on fire and all you do is you pump two holes in the roof to let the smoke out the top, but the biliary injury continues because of the immune system, that that will be enough to stop you running into problems. But in combination, an antifibrotic with a better anticholostatic with something that is, you know, immune modulating, you know, that, that then starts to get very appealing. And the sequence which you may give those drugs to the patients may come down to asking how much fibrosis there is and where you are in the stage of your disease by Fibroscan or MRE. Thank you, Gideon. I thank you all. There are many open questions still. The time is over. We'll be happy to try to answer as many of these questions uh, as possible in the breaks to come. And we continue, I think, with the breakout sessions. I thank you all for participating. It's been a fantastic session. Thank you.